If you Google what is designed for manufacturability, the Wikipedia says it is the general engineering practice of designing products in such a way that they are easy to manufacture. For a complex process such as integrated circuit design in VLSI, the DFM encompasses various methodologies starting from design specification to the product launch of an IC. With the continued scaling of transistors, patterning is conducted at a resolution limit. Concerns about manufacturability have become so pervasive that once dealt with design rules just with the DRCs and layout changes are now moving upstream in the design cycle. So in this video, we, are, we will try to understand some of the very important concepts of DFM and how it is used in the entire design flow. DFM does not mean just having some rules in the layout design and fixing those. DFM has to be taken into consideration in all aspects, be it circuit design, be it simulation or layout design. So we'll go through the importance of DFM and the variability, how variability impacts DFM and what are the challenges in the modern sub-wavelength lithography techniques? And finally, we will discuss about the model-based DFM approach and why it is required. I would like you to know that the contents of this video are mostly referred from the book Nanoscale CMOS VLSI Circuits Designed for Manufacturability by Sandeep Kundu and Ashwin Sridhar. So the DFM by definition refers to the new design techniques or tools or methodologies that ensure printability of patterns, control parametric variations, and enhance the yield. Now, there are three parameters here, as you can see. The printability of patterns, right? It should ensure the printability of patterns. What do we mean by that? That means, like, if there is a metal of width 100 nanometer, we should make sure that it is getting manufactured of 100 nanometer. Since our lithography tools are already at the limit, it's very essential for us to ensure the printability of patterns. Now, you can ensure the printability of patterns maybe using some design rules such as DRCs. The second thing that we have to do is control parametric variation. When I say parametric variation, it does not impact just the layout. It impacts the behavior and the functionality of the chip itself. Say, for instance, we can take threshold voltage of the transistors. Now, if ion implantation hasn't happened properly, definitely there will be variations in threshold voltage of each transistor and we cannot completely ensure that 100 percent this will be achieved controlling this parametric variation is a essential part as well and we can also do that by using modeling and many other uh, techniques we will see that further and enhancing yield we always know that the yield in vlsi is very low we are throwing almost more than the half of the chips that we are manufacturing that's because even if a single defect found in the entire chip, if a single transistor work doesn't work properly in the entire chip, it may completely invalidate the entire chip consisting of millions or billions of transistors. So we need to ensure that we will minimize these kind of defects that are going to happen. So the DFM encompasses various methodologies starting from the design specification to the product launch of an IC. So example of the, DRC, uh, the DFM techniques are using DRCs or dummy fill. We will understand why we use dummy fill and other things like circuit simulation parameters. We can change them in order to incorporate these changes at the manufacturing level. Also the model parameters uh, used at uh, SPICE or other cases. So till 65 nanometer process, DFM issue were handled mostly by the post-processing layout. It was like we complete entire layout and then we check for timing. If no issues of timing has been found, then the issues of DFM were taken into consideration using simple design rules such as DRCs. But post-processing was having iterations in advanced nodes. This was because there was more number of DRCs adding up. Also, there was more layout changes which are going to happen so this was increasing the total time to tape out also the designers are always juggling with the multiple design targets such as area performance signal integrity and the reliability and etc and on top of that we need to ensure the dfm as well 
Again, in addition to the normal DRC, such as minimum length and minimum spacing, these are the some of the DRCs that we can we can include many other DRC rules, such as uh, the grid rules and etc. DFM is also concerned with the gate critical dimension, interconnect critical dimension variations, the area of gate and also the interconnect. It cannot vary too much. Also, the random dopant fluctuations, which are called RDFs which impact the threshold voltage of the transistors and mobility impacts and other irregularities which can be obtained from transmission electron microscopy or many other uh, uh, microscopy techniques or other studies. So let's have a look at the DFM model. DFM takes the design database input as well as the process information which is very important for DFM to verify. And this DFM box can result into three different conditions. Now we have shown only two here. Uh, there are two which are inside the second one okay I'll tell you later about that now if there are no challenges at the DFM level while incorporating the transistor and layout changes which are required for DFM then a modified uh, design uh, will be given which consists of transistor and layout changes such as dummy fill now dummy fill is a requirement of uniform density as we know if we don't have uniform density then during manufacturing especially during the polishing of the wafer at that time it can res result into rough surfaces as well as it can result into variations in metal patterns right to avoid this we will have dummy fill which will consist of dummy cells the base layer dum uh, dummy cells as well as the metal layer dummy fill including the oxide fill also at the later stages optical proximity correction also will be added that is to aid the lithography techniques so this will be an iterative process if uh, the design team needs more changes again they will remove these things and make their changes and give it back to the dfm the second thing is that information feedback to the designers regarding the areas of the design where such dfm changes which i told right the dummy fill addition and these things are not possible or cannot be incorporated automatically if there are challenges that are faced during dfm okay because of some cell the dfm fill cannot be added or some kind of that right it will violate some drc in that case this has to be this information has to be given to the designer uh, design team they have to make some changes and give it to give it back to the dfm box again the third possibility is that the parametric impact of dfm on the design process including the sda signal integrity and reliability could be a significant one which means let's say i add uh, a metal fill that metal fill could significantly increase the coupling capacitance that a normal wire sees if the coupling capacitance is pretty high then it can really cause the signal integrity issues and also the reliability issues there there can be examples given on reliability also if it impacts the signal integrity definitely it's going to impact the sta which is timing so these kind of situations again this has to be given back to the uh, uh, sta or uh, whichever corresponding team so that's why both of these results the second and the third results i have i'm mentioning i have included in the one single box which is manufacturability analysis results including the circuit parameter variations and pointer to changes has to be given next is variability the parametric variations as i mentioned earlier are major design concerns today Parametric variations include the process, voltage, and temperature variations. Also, the on-chip variations that are going to happen during manufacturing. For example, let's take this equation, which is ID, the current equation of the drain current in saturation region, which is half mu and CX divided by L, which is minus VTH whole square. Now, if you carefully observe these, one or the other parameter, maybe mu N or CX, these are process parameters. Now, if they are not constant, we always assume them as constant. How would I even model my transistor and how would I even uh, simulate the circuit? So you might understand how important it is for us to characterize these parameters and take control of those parameters, how much it can vary. We have to estimate it statistically and uh, use it in our circuit simulations. The circuit models need to be pretty accurate 
and model parameters need to be correct in order to make sure that the functionality and timing is correct. For timing, the design experience is the process voltage and temperature issues and these issues are considered as different corner cases and timing can be uh, ensured. There are several other parametric variations that I have listed in this uh, uh, table. You can see that each of these are variations and the impacts on different type of uh, uh, analysis or different phase of circuit design or uh, the IC design itself. Now if you can take the mask imperfections it can lead to the variations in the channel length if the variation in channel length happens as we have seen that it varies the, the current and many other stuff right it will vary the circuit uh, itself the para, the behavior of the circuit and it can vary the mask imperfection can vary also the temperature also the timing analysis and similarly alignment and tilting variations during manufacturing can lead to the channel width variation which will impact the supply voltage and as well as the rc extraction right also the focus or dosage during implantation as uh, and all which which can lead, uh, result into threshold voltage variations or uh, the reliability issues such as aging or the positive bias temperature inversion or instability or negative bias temperature instability these are the reliability issues and it could impact the IV curves. Similarly, all these different things, right? These can impact uh, our uh, analysis and the design process itself. And this could be hazardous in some situations. Some situations it could be, it, it may not be that uh, impactful, but in, in some situations it could be havoc. Finally, we will move to the model-based approach. So the DFM is in use since 1990. It's an old thing, right? It's not, it's not true that it is included a few years back or something like that. At sub-wavelength lithography, the DS is not sufficient to ensure the high yield. When I say sub-wavelength lithography, imagine that I have the lithography tool, which is consisting of 193 nanometer light source, and I'm trying to manufacture a metal of width 100 nanometer it is the smaller it is smaller than the the source the light sources wavelength itself how are we going to manufacture it that's a complex process and this complex process because of this thing the interactions between polygons has been found to extend well beyond the adjacent features which means if there is a metal adjacent to another metal the edges, it's not only the adjacent metal that is going to impact the printability of this metal. It's also the second next adjacent metal also going to impact. Second and third metals are going to impact. So these are very important things and this has increased the DRCs exponentially in modern techniques. Nowadays, we are going to include the extreme ultraviolet lithography, which will work at 13.5 nanometer, which is a good news for us all. So the model-based DFM have evolved to incorporate multiple effects, including the diffraction, CMP induced wafer surface modulations and the random dopant fluctuations. So model based DFM will use statistical analysis to include all these cases. Standard cell methodologies today incorporate model based post lithography analysis that yield highly compact, printable and functional cell on silicon. I hope you got some idea of what is designed for manufacturability and how it is included in the IC design process. If you like the video, please do subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so. And I'll see you in the next video. Thanks a lot for watching and bye-bye.